Programming Throwdown, episode number five, C Sharp. Take it away, Jason. Hey, so I was moving. Uh, actually, I was packing and getting ready to uh, move. I'm moving over to Silicon Valley, which is uh, which is quite a large move from uh, from us over here on the East Coast. So. The heart of computer nerddom. Yeah, I'm hoping you know we might be able to get some uh, you know guest uh, guest speakers on the show who actually write programming languages. It'd be pretty epic. You're moving just for the benefit of the show. That's, That's right. That's so considerate of you. That's right. Taking one for the team. I'll do anything just for, for our this listeners. Podcast. That's right. Anything for you guys to get you guys the information you need straight from the source. So um, oh, we sound like real journalists. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, but yeah, I'm moving over to the valley, and uh, it's been kind of interesting. Um, you know, I lived uh, lived at home for the first few years of college, and then got my own place. And uh, you know, there's stuff kind of scattered. Some stuff in my parents' house, some stuff at at, at the place I live at now. And uh, you know, this has sort of been like defragmenting, uh, but for my entire life. So kind of like I think it's a useful process. Sometimes you, know, you end up with so many different fragments. Uh, on your on your computer hard drive and things start slowing down you get some overhead and so this is kind of how it was with me where i could never really find anything i had some stuff my parents house your some disc stuff my access place. was getting slow yeah that's right my access for uh for anything was slowing down and so this is a chance for for uh my family and i to sort of defragment so we've been busy the past uh couple of weeks doing all that stuff and getting ready for the move so is it as painful as normal defragging it is pretty painful. It's one of those things where, you know, a disk access, so like, you know, someone getting mail or something will cause the whole thing to restart. Oh. Yeah, it can get rough, it can get painful. But uh, what have you been up to? Uh, not too much, not too much. Uh, pretty much same old, staying busy at work, so that's good. Yeah. Uh, not, nothing drastic like moving. Yeah, you didn't and, decide to just move or anything no. like that across country. Can't, can't talk about defragging my hard drive, I guess. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But uh, all right, well, but yeah, I think you can talk about um, some iOS stuff that's going on. Yeah, so I was you know checking the news today and, and saw these a couple of different people rep- reporting that uh, I guess it's still kind of a rumor thing as everything is with Apple until Apple decides, as Apple people put it, until Steve decides to announce <laughs> that's it. That's right. And uh, so they are saying that uh, the new version of iOS is going to allow for over the air updates. So uh, you don't have an uh, iOS device. Oh, I guess you have. You might have an iPod Touch. But uh, having an iPhone, I'm a frequent uh, finder of plugging it in and having it tell me it needs to update and download, you know, like a very large file and update my phone fairly frequently. So it's kind of a pain. It's pretty annoying to have to, you're trying to sync up and get everything loaded, you know, get your new podcasts on your, on your, you know, device so that you can listen to them because you're out of good stuff to listen to. And so you plug it in and then you got to like wait for it to download and do its thing. And it's kind of annoying. So pushing it over the air would be interesting that you wouldn't have to do that anymore. It would just, you know, all of a sudden say a new one's available and or just, you know, do it. But of course, you know, it leads to a lot of problems, right? Like, you know, these are complicated devices with, you know, no, different than a feature phone, which is, you know, pretty small amount of code, relatively speaking, to something like, you know, iOS that, you know, if you're trying to push an OS update like that, then, you know, it's pretty complicated. But I think this is the commonplace on Android phones that they do over the air updates eventually. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, always a little bit, takes a little bit longer and everybody want to make sure it's going to work because you don't want it to fail or crash and all that that stuff. Yeah, one of the interesting things about it is you have to have a sort of you have to be rather solid like in your API. You know, if the API changes as a result of an update and that breaks one of your apps and this happens while you're on the road or or uh you know, while you're out on travel. Um, this could cause, you know, a serious problem. Let's say you had some app that was storing something that was very important, you know, some time sensitive, like well, where, where your appointments are at this, you know, destination, you're yeah, on work point, travel. Yeah. yeah, now the iPhone pushes out the update that changes the API and breaks your app and you're hosed until you get back, back, get back home. Yeah, so hopefully then maybe they would limit this to only, you know, minor revision numbers and not right. major revision numbers. Right. I, you know, I don't know how that's going to work, uh, but that's interesting. So this is... 
I guess as a software developer, you got to think about this, you know, how are you going to update and push out patches to your code? And then additionally, what's going to happen when you have to support multiple different users at different version numbers, because that becomes a big deal and uh, it can be very complicated to manage that. You know, I know, especially people doing web programming, that's a huge mess is how do you know all the different browsers are out there and all the different versions of those browsers. And it can just be a really large pain. Right. The one who seems to have it the best, at least from a user experience standpoint, is Firefox. Like Firefox, when you update it, it goes online and tries to find updates automatically for all of your extensions. And um, it must have some metadata in the extension where, you know, host side, the extension can say, I support Firefox version 4.01. And uh, if you upgrade to 4.02, it tells you that this, you know, extension might not be supported. Um, but then maybe as soon as 4.02 comes out, the uh, extension writer on his side says, oh, this 4.02 works fine with my extension. Um, no changes were necessary, or maybe they make the changes. And when you upgrade to 4.02, it either upgrades the extension or it doesn't. It says you're good to go. So Firefox seems to have this streamlined. Well, I, you know, I didn't even know this was happening until somebody said it, and I was like, oh, that, that's amazing. But Chrome automatically updates continually. Just whenever you start it, it just does it. It doesn't ask you, doesn't prompt you, it just does really? it. Really? Yeah. So that's to keep everybody on the notice. same version or whatever. I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard that. I was just trying to Google here just a second ago. Yeah, I believe Google, it. Google. I've never, I've so never seen You've never Chrome. seen it be yeah. an update, right? Yeah, this is why. It just Either they're not it. doing anything or, <laughs> yeah. It's just, there, it just does it, right? It just auto-updates for you. So, I mean, they're obviously, that's an, another way to do it, keep everybody, force them on the same version. Yeah. But, no, it's something to think about because it, it makes a big difference. And like Jason was saying earlier, if you auto update and choose to go that path without prompting people and you ruin something, you know, you're going to have a lot of angry users at you. And for right. somebody like Apple or, you know, Google or the Mozilla Foundation, you know, they may not care that you know, a thousand or even 10,000 of their users get upset that, you know, a, a auto update pushed out and broke something. But if you're like most people and, and you work for a client base of just a few people or tens of people or hundreds of people, if you get any of those people lose work or clients or money because of your crashing, you're going to have some explaining to do. Yeah, you're in trouble. You know, I've always felt like there should be, you know, I feel like install shields have been very streamlined and have become very open. Like there's that NSYS, NullSoft, scriptable install system. Mm -hmm. And every installer kind of looks the same. You know, every open source installer looks the same. It's because it is the same. There's this there's this package of open source software that, that has installers, but all of them are, are static. There is no like open source living installer, which, you know, will keep updating your software. Mm. And so for the latest open source software I've created, which is this MameHub project, I've actually tapped into Google code. I created a Google code project that just has the binaries of my open source project and one that has the source code. So I end up with two Google code projects. And the binaries project, I just do a SVN update. So I'm relying on something that's meant for source code, but I'm using it, sort of hacking it so that it works on binaries. And that's because you have you need all of your users to be on the same client. Right. Because it would cause confusing things to happen if they weren't. Right. Everyone has to have the latest version. Otherwise, everything falls apart in this yeah. example. So that's interesting. Yeah. So there needs to be like an NSYS for applications that have a lot of updates, which is most open source applications. So mm -hmm. there needs to be some framework. Um, someone needs to, you know, try to buckle down maybe, you know, Apple or Google or one of these big companies and, and just release something out to the public, which will, I think that will help development and, and help, uh, you know, the use, use base of these, you know, rapidly evolving applications. Yeah, well, some stuff will be harder to do because they, you might not un ever close it. Like some stuff just runs all the time or server software just yeah. runs and runs. So that's, that's where true. something like Erlang's, you know, hot swapping could be really cool where you yeah. don't even have to bring down the software just the next call to a function just goes to the new function instead of the old function. Yep. And so that's pretty cool. So stuff like that is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. All right. So, so, so let's say you had this amazingly cool installer core thing and then somebody else didn't have the source code for it. How would they figure out what your software was doing? What tool would they need? What would that be called? I think they would need a decompiler. A decompiler? You mean 
the opposite of compiling? That's right, yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about decompiling, which is something that uh, you don't hear very often, you know, probably uh, most of you out there have heard of compilation and compiling source code, but decompiling is actually taking, you know, an object file, something you compiled already, and, uh, you know, often it's the machine code or the assembly code, and taking that and reverse engineering it automatically. So a computer program that turns that back into source code which is which is more human readable. Interesting. So so this came up because you saw an article that was kind of like a little tutorial about decompiling. Right. So this comes with uh, somebody explains a they offer a decompiler on GitHub that you can download and play with. And uh, they offer uh, an explanation on how decompilers work with flowcharts and all those cool visuals and uh, a little step-by-step tutorial on, on what the process is of decompiling. And so I felt like this was very interesting and very relevant to, um, to uh, anyone out there who writes code, you know, in a commercial setting or anyone who wants to take programs and you want to say, I wonder how this works, especially if it's maybe a smaller, simpler program or if it's a, a DLL, a piece of a program. Uh, you know, for example... The guys who write the um, hacks for 3D games, like the people who went in Counter-Strike Source and wrote that hack so you could see through walls. Well, they used a decompiler. And Wait, people cheat? I know. It's What? It's, uh, it's a tragedy. My world is shattering. I think the world is just falling apart. The Omni mic has just broken in half. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, the way these people do, and, and now you know a lot of this, they, they get caught and things like that. So we don't recommend anyone cheat on Counter Strike, and this isn't one of those faux, you know, save like, your cheating for cheating your nephews at Candyland. That's right. We, <laughs> you know, this isn't one of those like don't try this at home. Like really, don't if you if you try to decompile, you know, Counter Strike Source and change the executable, they will ban you forever, and you'll have to buy all of your games back. So well, do not do that. As we say nearly every episode, neither of us are lawyers, but I believe decompiling actually is against the DMCA. That's right. Uh, if it's a copyrighted, you know, controlled source or controlled executable, in other words, you know, if you try to decompile something in Windows or source, you know, Steam, you know, if you try to decompile any of those things that basically someone hasn't given you permission to do, yeah, bad stuff can happen to you. So don't do that. Yeah, you'd be in trouble. But Or if, consult your lawyer first. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, or maybe get a law degree and a software engineering degree. Then you can decompile. And then email us and tell us the implications of decompiling stuff at programmingthrowdown at gmail. Com. That's right. So often what you would do with the decompiler, what one would do, is to take... Against a program you have permission. That's right. Is to take one of the DLLs of, that the program is using, one of the dynamic libraries. Um, often the libraries might be open source, like as the case with Glut. There's something called Free Glut. And uh, say, you know, what are the function calls to this? And so if you were to decompile Glut, uh, there's some function in there that has to do with, you know, rasterizing triangles or setting up the uh, OpenGL state. And uh, in that function call, it pa- you might be passing in an alpha value. So um, you can actually, by using a decompiler, you can go to where it initializes the glut state and by default make every triangle an alpha value of 50%. So make every triangle transparent by default unless the game specifies otherwise. So chances are, you know, in Counter-Strike 1.6 or whatever, all the triangles, you know, they didn't care. They just made everything solid or they didn't specify. So by by going in, decompiling glut.dll, going in the source code and making all the triangles transparent, then recompiling, making a new glut executable and put Putting that back in, now you've changed the game. You've made it to where everything is transparent and you can see right through walls and, and, and cheat and see your enemies before they can see you. That's crazy. So I, I'm not an experienced that much at all in decompiling, but I, the way that, I mean, the transformation to go from source code to executable is fairly lossy. You lose a lot of information. So when you decompile, you're not finding, you're never going to find the original source code. You're just right. finding an an equivalent representation of source code, so let's say C, that could have generated that executable. But you have no way of telling if it is the C file that generated it. In fact, like you're not going to get variable names and stuff like that. Those will be just, you know, machine generated. But you could have some, somebody could have written a for loop and you could decompile it as a while loop with a counter right after that. And machine code is exactly the same as what a for loop looks like. Right. Right. So it, like, like Patrick said, it's a lossy, you know, compiling is a lossy operation. And so um, the code will often look just vastly different. 
And so oftentimes, too, the, there could be errors in the decompiler. And when, you, when the code's recompiled, there could be corner cases that now fail, whereas they would have resulted, not fail, but returned something different than they did before. Um, and I guess it causes problems with when you're in a high level language like C or C++ or higher level language like C or C++. So the higher you go, the worse it gets because one instruction can map to many assembly routines, assembly instructions. And so trying to figure out heuristically what high level instruction compiles to what machine code and then go back. I, I guess you look at call graphs and stuff like that to understand what the structure of the code is so you can try to restore that and right. find, find patterns. Now, there is decompiling at many different levels. So, for example, let's say I gave you a PYC file, which we talked about on the Python episode, which is, you know, a executable or a binary file for the Python virtual machine, not for your actual machine. You could go from a PYC file to a PY file. So, you're not dealing with any machine code. You're going for a machine code from machine code for this fake machine to the source code for that fake machine. So often, like you'll have Python decompilers, but they won't actually deal with the assembly. And you'll have um, the C sharp, which is the language we're getting into, um, actually comes with an obfuscator, which is designed to prevent um, decompiling um, of the uh, CLI. Um, code back into C sharp, and we'll talk about that a little more later. So, so obfuscating your code would add instructions that basically do nothing, but make it that much harder to decompile because it's going to confuse those high-level structures that are it's used to seeing. Right, exactly. So you might have some for loop, and the obfuscator might turn into a backwards for loop, or might somehow add a nested for loop where the outer for loop just runs once. Just something that will throw off most decompilers. Interesting. Seems like, too, the more optimized your code is, both in the way you code it and in the way the compiler settings are, the worse it would get. Right. Yeah, so if there's a function that's inlined, then um, that function, when you decompile, will be inlined. So literally, the contents of that function will be just pasted over and over again everywhere that function's called. And so that makes the code very hard to read. Yeah, interesting. interesting. That's a good, good thing if you ever need it. Um, there's a couple of tools out there to do that and, and a bunch of kind, but that's a whole uh, art unto itself. Um, and one, one, where I, one place I know that a lot of decompilation is used is uh, viruses. We were trying to think of this earlier, and it slipped my mind, but viruses and malware, um, people will decompile them because they want to understand better uh, how they're working and what they're doing so that they can write detectors for it, pre prevent those specific problems from happening again. So there's people whose lives are, or her work lives are devoted to decompiling malicious software and understanding, you know, what it does and where it came from, because most viruses don't come with source code. Right. That's right. And on the other side of it, people writing viruses, they want a way to, uh, you know, have many different ways of injecting the same virus. So if they can look an executable, they can generate the call graph from that executable. And then they could put certain lines of the virus. They could split the virus up into modules and run different modules at different areas of the EXE. So it's not just one big block of the virus. And that can be harder for things like Norton antivirus to detect. Very cool. Very cool. Well, the next thing I, I was going to bring up, I guess this is, gets kind of political, but, you know, the this week, AT&T uh, has been the first major U.S.-based um, ISP to roll out caps for their broadband plans. So before, it was always just kind of like, however much you want to use, that's fine. Or if you were using way, way too much, you know, terabytes of data torrenting all day, then, you know, you might get a knock at your door or a letter or, you know, whatever. But that, you know, there wasn't stated caps. They just let people do whatever. And now, not only are they giving caps, the caps are pretty low. It looked like, you know, I was looking for DSL, it's 150 gigabytes. And for yep. Uverse, 250 gigabytes, that's not a lot. Not at all. I mean, some Linux distributions can easily push, you know, four or five gigabytes. If you're streaming HD movies from Netflix, uh, you can hit that cap pretty quick. Those are low caps. You know, when I first saw this, I thought people, I agreed that the idea of going to capping is bad because I feel like it's going to stifle innovation. And, right. you know, you're not going to know what will never exist because people can't use their bandwidth to the fullest. But at the same time, I understand there's a lot of people out there abusing it. And I figured that the cap would be really high. But it turns out 250 gigabytes is not really high. That's just a little high, but you could easily conceive of where you might hit that. Yeah, I mean, let's say you're testing Linux distributions and you download, you know, five or six of them. And uh, let's say, you know, in my case, I have um, 
32 gig, uh, 32 bit PC and a 64 bit PC. So I have to download Ubuntu twice. So, you know, and that's just tertiary to you know, just daily usage of the internet and YouTube and things like that. That's just on top of those things. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that much, many people like this. I, I mean, I understand that they, I guess they're a business, right? And they're losing money. So they've got to, they can't keep spending money to keep up with the top 1% of users. So they got to come up with some, some way to do that. But I just feel like this isn't the right way. I feel like it's too potentially them motivated by trying to prevent the streaming of internet video that right. they really feel threatened. I mean, I, I'm probably part of this problem, right? I, I canceled my cable. I don't have cable anymore. I wasn't watching it. I watched my stuff on Hulu and Netflix and YouTube and, you know, I have my PC hooked up to my computer or my PC hooked up to my computer, my PC hooked up to my <laughs> TV and uh, I just watched stuff from my, from the internet. And so I don't need cable. It was a, it was a waste of $50 a month for me. Yeah. Um, I believe when I move, I'm actually not going to, I'm going to try and go cable less. So I've been cable. I've been with is cable. This, is this because of me? Have I inspired you? You have. You have. Wow. It actually is because of you. No, true story. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, oh man. But no, I, when I was, uh, I don't know. When I was sometime in high school, I was really asking, oh, I want cable. And it was when, you know, South Park was new. I really wanted South Park uh, to watch South Park. And so uh, we got cable and I've just had it ever since. I'm going to try to go cable-less. And, uh, you know, the big thing that you miss out on is sports. Sports, yeah. And uh, so, but now, like, a lot of them, ESPN.com is doing streaming on the internet. Yeah, but like you that. actually have to have a cable subscription to be able to stream Oh, ESPN. really? Yeah, yeah, It yeah. checks? It, so, yeah, somehow, it, knows. it, it yeah, ties like, your IP to... My dad has cable, and he can watch ESPN on the internet from wherever he wants. But I don't have it on my cable plan. And somehow they know because I can't register for it. Oh, how does that work with the phone? Because you can watch, can you watch ESPN on your phone or no? Oh, not on my phone. No. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know case by case how it works, but yeah, sports yeah. is really the only thing. And some, like I think yeah. MLB has a package even on a Roku box and on almost every platform where you can watch uh, Major League Baseball. Um, oh, on um, pretty much a any of our non-US listeners are going to be like, what are these guys <laughs> talking about? That's right. But, but that's okay. Yeah, I think in Europe they've always had caps or or tend to have caps more than we do, and they have less, even less competition than we do. So yeah, I have a friend in Australia who has a cap of 250 gigabytes, and he says he never comes close. So it's hard to say what their use case is over there, though. Or they yeah, use the problem is, I agree. I 100% agree. On my iPhone, I have the unlimited data plan I was grandfathered in, and I look and I've. You know, my total usage, my average usage, so if you take, you know, how much I've used total since I've had it divided by the number of months I've had it, you know, about, I probably just offended a bunch of people that had to explain that. <laughs> but if you, if you do that, right, my average is like way, you know, low. It's not that big at all. And in fact, it's, you know, basically smaller than their small plan. But then there is one or two months relating to when I was normally on business travel or personal travel to places that didn't that pay for internet in the hotel or whatever, that I use my iPhone a lot. Right. And on those months, I went well over those low caps. Right. And so those months, I would have been smacked with a huge bill. Yeah, the other thing too is it seems like, and I don't know too much about network infrastructure, but I'll go on a limb here. <laughs> It seems like the solution to this is to is something akin to IPv6, right? Where the internet is multi-tiered, and so for example, if um, let's say we're using IPv6, and we're both under the same like fifth or sixth octet, so we'd still be under Bright House. Um, in this case, we could um, I could maybe query your computer and say, you know, hey Patrick, have you watched this YouTube video? You know, or anyone else within my neighborhood, let's say. And say, have you watched this computer, uh, this YouTube video? And if they have, get the video from them. It seems like you could more intelligently distribute the bandwidth. You know, if bandwidth is really the issue and not just making money, the, being the yeah, issue. I agree. There was their incentive to pioneer those efforts, though. I mean, because ultimately people are just going to use them to not pay for cable. And since a lot of the internet service providers are also content distributors right. here in the United States. I don't feel like they would be motivated to do that. But you're right. I mean, that's how, um, and, and this is not and by any means my expertise, but that's how cloud centers work a lot. Like if you're at a data center, if you're transmitting within the data center, 
you basically don't have to pay bandwidth costs. Right. You only pay bandwidth costs if you have to leave the data center. And, and that's I for think, that very reason, like yep. what you're describing. And as the stock market expert sitting next to me knows, that's how this, <laughs> <laughs> I believe you explained to me one day, that's how the stock market works, right? Like there are right. these different brokers. Tiers. If you're, if you go through your non-direct access broker, so, you know, just, uh, uh, like an E-Trade or a Charles Schwab or Scott Trade. Yeah. Then they'll try to match your orders within their own customer base because then they don't have, they charge you a commission, but they don't have to pay a commission. Right. And then if that doesn't work, then they try to go to like next neighbor partners and slowly work their way up and out of the last resort, you know, put it actually on the open market where they have to pay all sorts of uh, fees and stuff. Right. So the, the infrastructure is, I mean, not the infrastructure, but the, but the historical, um, you know, use case is there. So, I mean, this, the idea of this, you know, different strata and, you know, trying to look locally, you know, these techniques are used in many different avenues. And the fact that they aren't used in the internet distribution, you know, mechanism, and instead they're going for caps makes me think that it's not actually, you know, based on these huge operating costs, but it's based more on just restricting content. So, so talking about bandwidth caps, would you have had any reason this last uh, week to hit your bandwidth cap? <laughs> That's right. So I, um, I definitely would have hit just about any bandwidth cap. Because Natty Narwhal came out, which is uh, Ubuntu 11, and uh, <clears throat> I went ahead and got the 32-bit and the 64-bit, and I think I got there was one that was DVD size, one a live CD. I managed to get it on a on a um, a USB stick for one of my computers that doesn't have a CD drive. Um, so. I uh, I went ahead and updated to Ubuntu 11. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a huge Ubuntu fan. So, so how do you like it? I think it's awesome. You know, so, I think so what are the big differences? Yeah, so other than being an awesome horned creature from the sea, <laughs> is that what that is? A narwhal? Yeah, that's uh, the the thing with the big spiral tusk horn. That's a whale. Is that from like uh, like Lewis Carroll or something? Or no, it's real. It's an actual. Animal. Oh, this is a real thing. Oh, oh I was thinking like man. the Jabberwocky. He's like the Jabberwocky's oh, cousin or Jason. something. Jason. <laughs> oh, we don't have any biology. Biology Jason. fail. That's right. So yeah. So one thing about Ubuntu <laughs> is they. <laughs> they awesome. They adopted they adopted the uh, you know Windows Aero Mac OS X idea of using the GPU and to do you know graphical effects and to do to run the window manager. So uh, it's really slick. It's got different. It's it actually pops up from the side. I guess they just did that to be different than uh, than Windows and uh, OS X, which have the bar by default at the bottom. Um, but yeah, this bar comes up in the side. It's very search driven, which I thought was interesting. So at the first time, you know, if, if an app isn't pinned onto your, um, you know, taskbar, and most of you who run Windows, you know, 7 or Vista or OS X know what it means to pin something. Uh, if it, uh, if it isn't pinned on there, you have to search for it by typing in the beginning letters of the app you want rather than having like a start menu or something so like that. So it doesn't even have a start menu anymore? Yeah, that's right. So uh-huh. it has like these categories and then you can kind of scroll through, but it's very, you know. It's not encouraged to do yeah, it that way. Yeah, you're definitely encouraged to click on the start button or I guess the Ubuntu button and just start typing. Like, if you Is want- it a narwhal? <laughs> oh, you, you wouldn't know a, because you don't know what a narwhal is. Yeah, I think I'll go back and find out. I think it will be a narwhal the whole time. It's just laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> but you can click on it, start typing in Xterm, and Xterm will pop up. Um, but yeah, the interface is slick. Um, there is one issue, which is, you know, because it uses direct rendering, it uses OpenGL, um, it doesn't play nice with VNC. Uh, which is the, um, what does VNC stand for? Do you know? Virtual network client? That sounds, let's look it up. All right. So anyways, but continue on. Yeah. So basically. Virtual network computing. Ah, there we go. So, you know, VNC is a way that if you don't have a monitor, if a machine is headless, you can get a GUI onto that machine. All right. What is headless? So headless means that there's no actual physical keyboard or monitor. So for example, I have a server, uh, you know, in the office room, which, uh, which just sits and runs. It has no USBs coming out of it plugged into anything. It just has the network cable. And, and the power so, cable. Right, yeah, the power, <laughs> probably something else. But um, but yeah, basically uh, what I do is I VNC into that machine and I get a picture of my desktop inside of, you know, another computer's, you know, windowing interface. So VNC has issues with Ubuntu 11 and it turns out XDMCP, which is 
uh, you know, alternative to VNC also doesn't work in Ubuntu 11. But there is something called Free NX, and I was a little skeptical to install it because um, the, you know, the installation process is a little bit, you know, time consuming. It was this multi-step process you have to get on the internet. But I went through the process, and I can I can spare you guys the uh, the angst by telling you that uh, it definitely works and it's it's sharp, and uh, that's that that's the way to go if you have a headless headless machine running Ubuntu 11. So everything works good now and it's beautiful and all is well in the narwhal laden lands of the sea? That's right. I mean, the narwhal, they're, they're singing away. I'm sorry. I'm very still stuck on this. <laughs> I will probably tease you this for many months to come. Oh, man. Oh, the other thing, uh, if you run VirtualBox, which many of you do, and if you don't, if you've never used Ubuntu before, VirtualBox is a program which lets you run a virtual OS inside of your OS. And it's completely free, and um, you can use it to test out Ubuntu and find out if you like it and if it's if you want to switch over to it. But um, if you use VirtualBox, you have to change some of the VirtualBox settings to make it work with Ubuntu 11. And so go on the internet and look that up. Yeah, um, so that, you can that was my case. Experience. I installed it on VirtualBox um, on one of my Windows PCs, and it was like, this looks the same. And so then I was like, oh, yep. okay. Well, I'll have to figure out later what happened. Yeah, that's right. It'll um, uh, if you go on the internet, you can find a whole tutorial on it. So. The internet just full of information. That's right. That's right. As we talked about in another episode, I think we we've gotten our to the point now. Just on yeah, the we have to use a YouTube video to figure out how to pull up our pants or something. So. Well, it's that time of the show. The tool of the bye week. Tool of the bye week. So what's your tool, Patrick? So my tool of the bye week is the VLC, which is, oh man, that's not VNC. It's VLC. <laughs> oh, that's right. Which stands for virtual Here, you, I'll look Video it LAN. I don't know what the C stands for. I'll look it Video up. LAN something. Anyways, and so um, VLC is a movie player uh, open source. And what it does really good um, is it you know, supports all the different you know, uh, operating systems. And it allows you to play pretty much any protocol or uh, codec that, that you can think of. Not every single one, but nearly every one. I don't know if I've ever uh, run across one that it hasn't. And it's really powerful. It's one of those tools that you know most people use probably like 5% of the features. You know, it does, it'll do, you know, transcoding for you. So taking from one codec to another, it allows you to, you can stream stuff over the internet. Um, so, you know, you could like log into IP cameras with it and stream video from live cameras, like security cameras, mm -hmm. just tons and tons of things. But the reason that most people use it and the reason that I love it is because, and I, I don't know if it's compiled in or they have their own implementations, but basically all those codecs that if you ever like try to run media player on Windows, or, uh, you know, any sort of video players on any system that they don't necessarily always have the right codec. You need to go find the right plugin and install it and it's annoying. VLC just has all of that in its package. It's just handled for you. It's taken care of. So if you have a file that won't play or says you can't find codec or whatever the error is, I always try to play in VLC and they seem to have a really robust implementation that files that won't work in anything else tend to work in there. So yep. whatever they've done, they've done a really good job. Yeah, so VLC stands for Video LAN Client. Client, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. not that far off. They do have a server, I think, for like streaming video out to other computers, like a proprietary format. Um, it does use the... Well, not proprietary, but maybe unique. Yeah, or, that's true. Cause yeah, I guess proprietary. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, their own unique, their custom format. Um, yeah, VLC, most of the codecs are based on FFmpeg, but um, they've, uh, you know, hacked it a little bit to be a little bit more robust, as Patrick was saying. The thing I like the most about VLC is that, and maybe you could do this in, in, in Windows uh, Movie Player, but I haven't been able to do it. You can open up several videos at the same time, like several instances of VLC. Like I, I well, can't... I don't have multiple sets of eyes and ears. <laughs> no, you know, you could... <laughs> just, just kidding, yeah, no. So just if you wanted to, like, show multiple uh, demonstration videos or yeah, pro that's processing right. results. Or if you want to have one in the background and look at one and look at the other without, you know, having to switch between them in the in the playlist or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, playing my videos chops today, is... man. Look at, I have to pack all day. I, and then you've got to listen to me Man. nagging on you. Yeah. Ah. All right. But one cool thing that, that VLC – so VLC, you can just download. It's not that big. Install it you know, and be off and running and be so glad you heard this tip. And it will save you tons of time and, and pain. 
and harassment. But um, other thing I like to do is put it on my thumb drive. And they have a portable version, which uh, uh, we're going to talk about here in a minute a bunch more. But a portable version just means that, you know, you install it on a USB drive. And you still have to know what platform you're going to be on. So in this case, it's, you know, like a Windows one. And most of these portal apps are Windows apps. They probably have right. similar things for Linux as well. It's a little different case there. <laughs> but um, you put it on a USB drive. And what it does is it only writes locally. So if it writes anything, it's going to write it local to whatever the install folder is or it's not really installed it's just extracted there and or it won't write anything at all so that way if you have vlc the portable version on your usb it doesn't change the registry it doesn't install anything so you stick it into a computer and as long as you can see the usb drive you can run it and right. then you can watch videos so if you're ever at somebody else's house or whatever and you're trying to show some video and they don't have it they don't have the right codex whatever instead of going out and trying to figure out what you got to install you just open up vlc and run it right so uh so what now that I've you like VLC portable but you had some other portable apps that you you had on here that you were interested in for your tool of the bye week. Yeah, my tool of the bye week actually it relates a little bit to our last podcast recovered MATLAB but it's FreeMAT which is a free and open source uh, version of MATLAB that includes like the GUI, the uh, you know a version of Octave, I believe, to um, to handle you know the uh, virtual machine, and uh, it's also something I have on my thumb drive. So there's a website portableapps.com, and we'll put a link to this on the um, you know on the uh, episode in the uh, blog. But basically, the way portable apps works is you install this portable apps. Um, I guess what would you call it? platform onto your USB stick, and uh, you it's can, like a launcher. It's yeah. really you don't have to have it, but it's a launcher. Right, it's a launcher, and the newest version is also an auto updater. Oh, that's good. And so you, um, it actually the new version is pretty slick. It creates a second start menu as long as you have your USB stick plugged in. So you have your re- regular start menu with the all programs and the control panel and everything, and it pops up the second start menu, um, which is your portable apps menu. And you see all the apps on your on your thumb drive, and you can use this in airports, at airport kiosks, um, you know, public terminals. You can use this at like hotel lobbies, and uh, you have access to all of your apps. So you almost have a fully functional computer. Like you can carry around many of your favorite applications with you wherever you go, and and it's very consistent. So definitely check out portable apps. And if you uh, liked our last podcast on MATLAB and want to kind of play with it in a very controlled environment, definitely check out the free mat portable app. Yeah, it looks like uh, they don't use Octave or any of the other MATLAB open source interpretations. It looks like they have their own trying to go above and beyond even what MATLAB does and offer other features. So, oh, okay. So it looks okay. like they, they aren't aren't the same, but in the summer time, so maybe we should have had it in last week's podcast already. So. <laughs> That's right. Thank you for correcting that deficiency. Yeah, if you've used MATLAB before, you know, I've used MATLAB and used this before, and they're both extremely similar. I mean, the syntax is, is virtually identical. So if you have a certain graph or a certain set of data points and you just want to see what that looks like on paper, um, this free mat application will still get you where you need to go. But yeah, it's interesting. It looks like it's not based on um, on Octave or any of those. So two, two good apps of the week. Yeah. I app- think it means it's time for our feature segment, C right. Sharp. C Sharp. Sort of a controversial language. Is it? So, okay, I have a question. All right. C Sharp. I see it as C Pound or C Hash mm-hmm. or C... Why C Sharp? I mean, I know it's a sharp symbol for music, but it's always the pound sign. Yeah, so I think, putting me on the spot here, Uh-oh. putting me in the sweat room... I think that C sharp, like I think I, when a note is sharp, it's like better or higher okay. than the uh, than the regular note. So I think their their implication here is that C sharp is like a higher level of C. Oh, so kind of like C plus plus. Yeah, similar. So like increment C. Yeah, maybe it's like their way of. Well, you know, one thing is the sharp symbol does look like two pluses that were put too close together. Um, and so maybe it was sort of their way of both paying homage to C++, but also saying, here's something even better at the same time. Okay. All right. So now that we got that away, because that's always the most important thing is understanding why a programming language has the name it does. Right. That's right. That's If nothing else, you could say that at an interview and people would just assume you're an expert. 
I wouldn't try that. No, don't do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, C Sharp was was created by Ander. I'm probably going to butcher his name, so that's I always apologize. good. To start off saying it that way. Yeah, that, that's yeah, pretty much. Like this is a true story, right? <laughs> um, Anders Heilsberg from uh, he's a Danish software engineer. So I'll take your word on it. He uh, he was the original author of Turbo Pascal, and he was the chief architect of Delphi. So, um, he definitely has a strong background in programming languages. And so he, um, he's currently the lead architect of C sharp and he was also the, uh, the inventor. So was he just, uh, sitting in his sofa one day and his lazy boy? Oh, he did, uh, just thought, I'm going to make better than C plus plus C sharp. Or was, or is this part of his job? Yeah, so interestingly enough, uh, there was a battle between Microsoft and Sun at the time. You know, Sun. No, had, they didn't agree on something? <laughs> yeah, shocking. Shocking. Appalling. <laughs> well, I don't know. Does this mean Microsoft won because Sun doesn't exist anymore? Uh, <laughs> no, they did. They got bought. Yeah, they're Oracle now. So maybe. I they don't got know. assimilated. Yeah. It's hard to say what that, what that, whether that's a good or a bad thing, but I don't work for them, so I, I don't know. You'd have to ask somebody who worked for them. Yeah, maybe you know. No, I don't work for either. No, of them I, I mean our audience. Oh, oh, know. I see. You, the fourth wall. <laughs> yeah, but basically, you know, uh, you know, Sun came out with Java, which was very popular. It was adopted by you know the academic community very early because of its, you know, um, because of it being completely open source. Or at least I should say open standard. Java was an open source, but and cross platform. So uh it to was varying kind of, levels of the true interpretations of those words. But, yeah, yes. this it has become more open in, in you know, in the there is like an open JDK now and things like that. But at any rate, the uh, academic community jumped on it. They also um, have many different, you know, advantages, which you know we'll talk about later. But uh, Microsoft sort of wanted in on this. And so the um Anders Heilsberg went to Microsoft and started working on J++, which was Microsoft's implementation of Java. Hmm. So um, basically, there was a lawsuit. Sun sued Microsoft. And as part of the settlement of that lawsuit, uh, Microsoft had to abandon J++ and cease work on that. So um, that's when Anders decided to make a new language called C Sharp. And uh, so that's kind of where C Sharp was born from as a that's competitor a, that's to Java. That's an interesting and storied history, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the C Sharp, whenever I see this, I see these words C L R C L I. What is that? Yeah, so as people who, uh, you know, frequently listen to our podcast know, many of these machines are interpreted and they run on a virtual machine. So as the case of Python, you have a Python virtual machine with its own, you know, virtual RAM and virtual instruction set, etc. And we talked about that with the PYC files, etc. So CLR is the common language runtime, which is just a fancy way of saying the virtual machine okay. for C Sharp. Interestingly, though, there are several languages that can run on the same virtual machine. So, so if I'm remembering right, the CLR was kind of started the idea for it and was it drove C sharp. Right. So, so CLR was kind of coming first and then C sharp's features were designed to work on the CLR. Right. So, so the CLR is sort of a CLR is basically the virtual machine for C sharp in the same way as the Python virtual machine is the machine for Python. So you can't write code in CLR, but um, but it does sort of well, set you the groundwork. Uh, can't, I mean, there's not some well, no, form so, of... So code in CL, the code that runs on CLR is called CLI. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, which is the, what does that stand for? I think that's, uh, let's see. Common language instruction? Uh, that's my guess. So, so, but, okay, so yeah, you can't write in the virtual machine because it's just, a, it's a thing, it's a platform, but you could write at this, whatever it's a uh, common to. language infrastructure. Infrastructure, I So, so that is basically the byte code. So, right, so you could write code in CLI and it would run on the CLR. Just like uh, you could write PYC files if directly. You were weird. But yeah, you'd have to be quite the guru to do that. Uh, most people, interestingly though, so in the case of Python, if you want to create a PYC file, you have to use the Python programming language. Not the case in C Sharp. You can use C Sharp, ASP.NET. Um, there was, uh, C, there's Manage C++, 
which is another language, uh, Visual Basic.net, J Sharp, all of these languages wow. compile down to the same CLI code that runs on the CLR. So that's kind of interesting. So it's a, it, it is, you know, kind of a virtual machine that's meant to support a lot of different languages. Right. And so you think about it, they're trying to consolidate because Microsoft has this huge base. They have a lot of people, or at the time, they had a lot of people who were using ASP in Visual Basic. They had a lot of people writing C++, like, uh, what are those called? Uh, C, like C++ in, uh, in a web application. CGI. Oh, people yes, writing yes, CGI yes. modules in C++. There are people, you know, starting to adopt Java that needed something to fall on. And so all of these people, they wanted to create a virtual machine, one machine to unite them all. <laughs> so uh, One to bind them. Yeah, that's right. And so they'd use CLR and CLI. So now a lot of this is like Microsoft, you know, kind of research, closed doors, like them sort of, you know, hashing this out. And, and it's not open source at all. But some people have gone on and tried to open this technology. Now, they don't sell the CLR, the CLI, right? I mean, those right. are pretty much included. Like, you can just download them with Windows. Right. So it's part of the .NET framework. Oh. So if anyone's ever gotten that Windows I update, get that all the time. Yeah. So you're getting updates to the CLR and the CLI. Oh, they're sneaky. That, this, this is very well themed. We've been talking about auto updates all along. But yes. Yep. So, so they give that away for free. Right. But then the compilers and the tool, I mean, that's the stuff that they make their money off of is the, the compilers that compile from these languages to these bytecode forms. Right. And as we move on to, you know, and also this, this sort of, as we talked about vendor lock-in in the last episode, you know, if without any open source backing, if you were to compile a C-sharp application, you would have to run that application on Windows because the CLR and the CLI only exist for Windows. Oh. So, so if a person has a language or has programs they've written and they want to run on Linux, do they have no choice? Well, there is an open source version of the CLR and CLI. It's called Mono. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah. Do you know anything about mono? Uh, I, I think uh, that's a sickness. Right? Oh, other than <laughs> that's right. But uh, but yeah, mono. No, is... it's got a pretty cool little mascot, right? Like does some it really? Sort of, some sort of like cat. Oh, I thought it was a. Oh no, I'm thinking of Silverlight mascot as a moon. But um, yeah, no. I mean, the mono is is kind of the uh, answering my own question, kind of the answer to an open source. CLR, CLI, so that people could port it to Windows. Otherwise, somebody would have to, you know, like we talked about before, either, you know, reverse engineer the the CLR that Microsoft released or look at their standards and try to create it themselves. But the mono allows you to actually do that. They've done that for you. Right. That's right. So, and uh, the I would say the biggest, um, the people, excuse me, the people who use C Sharp the most would be... Um, People making websites, so web portals. Um, you know, many websites you go to where you see uh, what is it .aspx as oh, the extension. You know, how you, okay. most websites might be .htm or .html. Mm-hmm. Some are .aspx, and that is a um, that is something that's running on the CLI. So it's a website that's being driven by C Sharp or VB.net or one of those applications. So. I, I would say the web constitutes probably 95% or maybe even more of, of C-sharp use cases. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of enterprise people on Windows who use C-sharp for a lot of stuff. I mean, personally, I've used it for GUI development and it works really well for that on Windows if you just need to bang out a really quick Windows app. And, oh, that's true. And do. That's so, true. I mean, I, I feel like it has a lot of uses. You know, we were trying to look around and see, you know, what major well-known programs or projects use it and we couldn't find a lot. But I, I think it has a lot of use. A lot of people doing not just web stuff, but a lot of other stuff in it. Too. It's actually reasonably good to work, and I like it a lot um, mm-hmm. for having to do Windows stuff. Yeah, it's really tied into Visual Studio, which makes sense because it's all you know an integrated solution. It's all controlled by Microsoft, so they can really make that integration good. Right. So I mean, you can just drag and drop buttons onto you know while you're in Visual Studio, you can drag a button onto a frame. It'll put that button there. You can double click on it, and it'll create a function um, callback routine, which will get called when you click the button uh, just and it'll take you right to the code where you can just start banging away code when someone clicks this button I want to increment this variable 
And so it's very efficient, very quick. So I was completely wrong. Mono is Spanish for monkey. And so oh, the mono uh, little symbol is a stylized monkey's face. All right, mister. I know everything about narwhals. Yeah. <laughs> you aren't helping exactly any. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, this is not the programming throwdown is not mascot throwdown. <laughs> That's right. We'll save that one for another show. But, but similar to, uh, you know, Microsoft's implementation, um, you can program in C sharp, F sharp, Java, Scala, Boo, Merrily, VB.net, Python, JavaScript, and the list goes on and on. You can program in any of these languages and Mono will find a way, unless you're using some crazy specific library, to convert the code that you wrote into CLI. Yeah, so a lot of those languages actually have um, variants of them that run in the for the CLR, CLI. I'm confusing those. I'm probably getting them wrong, but that's okay. So like, for instance, Python Right is Iron Python, I think is right. the name. That's right. Uh, the dialect, name it where you are. It's not exactly the same because it's a different implementation. So there's nuances that are different. Right. And, um, you know, I think there's also an Iron Ruby. Um, so something similar right. that uh, you know, I don't know what the Iron thing is about, but yeah. yeah so they've got dialects that that are for instead of compiling down or being interpreted to whatever you interpret them for this. So anywhere where you have the CLR, you can guarantee that it's going to be able to run. Right. The biggest thing about the, um, and this is sort of pedantic, but we'll talk about it for a little bit. Um, the .NET framework and the CLR, the virtual machine, doesn't support reflection. And they're working on it, actually. They think that the next version will support reflection. But so many of these, like Iron Python and Iron Ruby, what they've done is they've taken the self-modifying code and the reflex reflexivity. They've taken that out of the language. So you're not talking about reflection's a thing that vampires don't have. <laughs> no. no, so do you know what reflection is? I'll put you on the spot. No, I I I could guess it's not gonna be pretty. Okay. Just take I'll this. give it a shot. So this this probably won't be pretty either, but I'll try my best. So reflection is essentially knowing about the language while you're inside inside the code at runtime. So in other words, in C++, you create a class called uh, foo, and that class has an X and a Y position, and you can put foo at different places on a grid or something like that. While you're running the code, the code just knows about memory and pointers and adding. It doesn't know about foo. You know, getting, again, going back to decompilers. Decompiling is so hard because the machine code, the assembly code, what you get at the end of a compiler doesn't know anything about classes or structures or functions or any of that. So, in contrast, if a language is reflexive, that means that the details of the language, so the classes, what variables are in that class, what kind of type those variables are, is built into the executable. And so you can do things like take all the variables inside foo and add one to them. So that's something you can't do in C++. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to say foo.x plus one, foo.y plus one. But, you know, in Python, you can say, take all the variables in foo and add one to them because the language at runtime knows about itself. So, so is this how something like Python also handles uh, dynamic typing? Right. That's right. Where you don't specify what a variable is. And so the, it can't be known until runtime. So mm -hmm. reflection is what has to be used for the code to be able to determine at runtime what type it is and what to call when you do a plus one is that a string and you're adding the character one to the string or you know doing something different or is it just an integer is it a float because all that has to generate separate code so that's how they at runtime determine what code to run yeah is that reflection kind of so ref so there are some things which are done what's with, with what's called a virtual function table so you can uh, say, you know, A plus equals one, and then you have this VF table, and this even exists in C++, which says, okay, A is a string, so that means I need to call this plus routine, or A is an int, or A is a float, so call different routines. But um, that works only at a low level, so dealing with an individual object, but it doesn't know about the higher structure. So, you know, something like what you described is like reflection at a, at a really low level. Okay, so and it's that's more the, powerful than that. Yeah, so reflection implies this high level reflection that includes like the classes and the functions and things like that. All right. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. So um, what do you think are some strengths of uh, C Sharp? Yeah, so I mean, I already talked about one a little, having done, you know, a fair amount of C Sharp, not, not a ton. I mean, there's, it's not my 
primary language. But, you know, again, a lot of the purpose of this show is to talk about tools in the toolbox. And I think C Sharp is definitely one. If you're going to do Windows programming and you need to do GUI, it works really well. I don't know why I'm obsessed with this as being the main strength, but it just is. Like, I, I really like that fact. And I never really did good GUIs or had good success doing GUI. I always felt it was complicated, never made a lot of sense and was hard to do. And I don't know if it was just Microsoft's products maturing to the point, Visual Studio maturing by the time I started using C Sharp or if it was a fact of C Sharp itself, but that's what I've really liked doing in it. Mm-hmm. And I find that, you know, being primarily a C++ coder, that a lot of that just works in C Sharp. Not always, but, you know, you can start writing code and then just kind of fill in the little bits and gaps when it doesn't work. Right. And so it's, it's very nice from that. Yeah, I mean, you know, C Sharp has a you know, a GUI for creating the GUI code. So in other words, you can drag and drop different buttons as we talked about. And so, you know, when you're creating a GUI, the whole experience is very visual, even from a developer standpoint. And not many tools out there give you that sort of drag and drop WYSIWYG sort of feel as as C Sharp. So what about you? What do you like? Uh, One thing I really like about it, I I used this in a previous job. Uh, It's the dynamic HTML support. So it's sort of like PHP, if you've ever used that where um, you know you want to make some website which is driven by a database or by some other data source or by some logic, maybe based on time. Uh, C Sharp can do all of that, similar to PHP, but uh, dinner, I feel like it's a lot cleaner than PHP. And so uh, it lets you do some pretty complicated things. And especially if you're using the Microsoft SQL database, those two work in tandem to really make web programming easy on you as a developer. I talked a little bit about knowing C++ and, and, and using C Sharp from there, but also, I mean, if you have some C++ code that you need to call in C Sharp, that's not a terribly complicated thing to do. I've had right. some C Sharp GUIs I made that needed to, for instance, uh, use some serial communications code that talked out over the serial port. And I was able to pretty much just put that in with very minor massaging, able to get that to work in there. So that was really easy. A lot of languages yeah. claim they have good C, C++ integration, but here it, it, it really is good. Yeah, a lot of languages suffer there and C Sharp excels there, definitely. And it's because, we, as we talked about, you know, you can compile C++ and C Sharp. They both get compiled down to the same language which is that that intermediate, that CLI. So that's what makes it so easy. Um, one of the weaknesses, I think, about C Sharp is, and again, you know, a lot of people compare C Sharp to Java because it was created sort of as an answer to Java. And C Sharp doesn't have an applet. Really no language other than Java that I know of um, and I guess C++ if you're using ActiveX controls and things like that. But nothing besides Java does the applet where you, you know, have this box in a website and that box just runs Java, the Java virtual machine. You can do whatever you want. You can write any logic you want. You know, C Sharp can create HTML, can output HTML, but Java can actually run inside of the virtual machine and do computation on the client side. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of a a love-hate relationship with me and applets. They're they're kind of a cool idea. It's kind of nifty, but oftentimes they're just so slow to load and execute and it'll crash a web page or your browser for no apparent reason when you try to go somewhere. So, but but, but it is definitely has its uses. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you can see a lot of... uh, I was looking at some website the other day on how red black trees work, and they actually created a red black tree in a Java applet. Oh, cool! And so you can kind of add nodes, and it could show how the leaves, you know, twist it up to to create the balanced tree. And so something like that is just impossible. Actually, now with JavaScript, which is something that we should talk about in a future episode, um, you know, things like that are possible with dynamic HTML and Canvas and all that. But uh, but you know, for a long time, I mean, for possibly a decade, nobody had this technology besides besides Sun and Java. Another weakness we talked about that, you know, the CLR is a Microsoft thing and the CLI. And so that, you know, the mono is there, but it's kind of an, I hate to say like an afterthought. I mean, it's not meant to be. Mono is often an afterthought. We were talking about (laughs) that. That th- this this th- it, it's good and it, it it works and if you need it and it works for you great but there's a lot of problems with it right that's so right it's not it's not as nice as using it on Windows and running like I I can't imagine why you would be on Windows and not just run .NET framework right so I had some uh, colleagues who were also in the PhD program and they did their work in C sharp. and they had a lot of issues when they transitioned their work over to the Linux cluster which was running Mono. 
Um, for one thing, many of the libraries just don't exist, or at least didn't at the time. So they're GUI. It would just they would try and say using system dot GUI, which was something that was built into the you know they felt was built into the C sharp language. But on Mono, it just would fail there. It'd say that doesn't exist. Um, on top of that, it ended up being extremely slow. Um, so they were just getting orders of magnitude slow down using Mono versus using the you know the Visual Studio virtual machine. Well, I, I mean, I, I think this is a good segment of disadvantage and disadvantage. We'll probably try to do this from now on and probably try to keep it as a recurring part of our programming language discussion. But, I, I mean, for me, that pretty much wraps it up for C Sharp. You got any final words to say on that? No, I think you said it best. When you need a GUI, you know, app in Windows, you know, you're trying to prototype something, uh, definitely C Sharp. You know, nothing can beat it for that for that application. Before we uh, for sign off here, I wanted to mention that we did get a one or two more ratings on iTunes. So thank you guys for that. Those of you who did that, give you a little shout out here. You know who you are. Um, keep doing that. It's actually slowed down a little. Um, so you know, we want to we want to keep keep getting those those clicks so we can uh, get reach a wider audience and you know share what we're doing. We we really enjoy this. You know, I like doing this, sharing this stuff. This is good material. It's it's hard. You know, if you if you're young and you're not at a university or if you're at university and you're not in the computer science department or you are and you're not understanding it or not in those classes yet or once you get out, it's hard to keep up and all this stuff is changing so frequently. And so doing this podcast helps us keep up. But, you know, I hope it is helping you guys. And it's, if anything, at least it's interesting and we make fun of ourselves and, and mess up and you guys can laugh at how wrong we are and how terrible <laughs> we are right. and it'll make you feel better about yourselves you know so no but we enjoy doing this and we want more people to be able to hear us and so uh so yeah. tell your friends write some reviews yeah if you find out if we say anything wrong definitely let us know because we're trying to learn um just as much as you guys so uh we uh we both have a lot of experience in the field but we do make mistakes and uh you know only you can help us keep from making the same mistake twice and possibly causing forest fires that, that's exactly what i was thinking <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good note uh, only you can help prevent forest fires that's right all right take care see you later the intro music is axo by binar pilot Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.